Hi, this is Janvi and I'm a guest manager here at Purple Valley in Goa. And today I'm joined by the wonderful Adam Keen and, and he's been teaching a retreat here for the past two weeks. And we've been talking a bit about his views about the globalization of yoga and the rapidly changing landscape of yoga as it, you know, mushrooms across different countries. And yeah, hopefully we can have a really interesting chat and yeah, Adam doesn't get into too much trouble for <laughs> this. <laughs> Probably will. Okay, so yeah, let's, uh, what's, what's the first question on the agenda? Well, so as someone who's been teaching for over 20 years now and kind of at the forefront of the Ashtanga movement, so to say, how do you feel any responsibility to, towards the tradition of yoga, the culture of India mm. and how do you, you know, what version of yoga are you trying to ignite mm. for your mm -hmm. students? Mm. I guess if I'm, I didn't think to answer this way, but if I think back, it was contextualized to me when I first learned it in purely gymnastic form. Yeah? yeah. And that's kind of what interested me. And mm -hmm. I kind of saw the two things different, although I was a philosophy student, actually, I'm very interested in Indian philosophy over here. The gymnastic form of yoga was over here. And my teacher at the time was he even cut out the, the Ashtanga mantra. He was really super not interested in, in any kind of cultural, um, you know, let's call it baggage <laughs> around this yeah he just wanted to do the asana you know and it attracted me and it kept me going and i i kind of feel that we have to take we have to believe that the student you know has the ability and you know and the the interest and the commitment over the time mm -hmm. to take the you know take the mantra themselves you, you know if you for most people maybe not me in this period in that period of time but for most people if you take the you know the yoga in its fullest iteration and, and you know shove it down someone's throat who just wants to be there to be calmer to you know to get toned and to get healthy and feel better I think it would scare a lot of people away and I think that you know so it's tricky because in one capacity I'm going to say yes it's it's important to contextualize it and I think he went a lot too far and I think it makes a difference in terms of how you approach the physical movement knowing its context. The very way that you move your body depends on the context in which it's, it's uh, defined for you. Yeah? Um, nevertheless, I would also say that however people get into what we're we calling you know, yoga asana, right? However people get into that, I'm kind of okay with that. You know? like, I don't mind how they're hooked. If they continue it, I'm of the firm belief that one, people have the capacity that they're not dumb you know yeah. they have and over time they will have the capacity and the interest if they keep practicing to find out what's going on you know mm. to find out where it came from i.e Patabi joyce for example in ashtanga yoga and to find out what was going on with joyce in terms of where he got it from right krishnamacharya and where krishnamacharya got it from you know and then you know and then it, it blows up after that because when we're talking about yoga obviously we're talking about you know a, a very ambiguous term which as you well know has been used in many ways over thousands of years in India, right? You know, originally it was an ascetic practice, which is just simply holding a hand in the air and, and that's done today, you know? Yeah. Um, sitting around fires, you know, just scorching in the midday sun. Yeah. Um, you know, it was an ascetic practice, nothing really about union, mm -hmm. but about, about disunion. So also we have to admit that the context of what we're talking about is also shifted um, massively as well. Um, and so I kind of feel that I'm allowing people to take the, their own idea for a while in terms of how they relate to it. And then right. maybe I also might kind of throw in a, a couple of pointers, but no one likes things being shoved down their throat, whether it's, you know, Christianity or whether it's, you know, Brahmanical ideas that surround yoga, you know? Um, so sort of tailoring it to the individual and whatever makes it accessible to them initially. Initially, like totally. The spark and I, I think totally. When, let it roll from, yeah. Whichever way you can get people to continue doing something consistently. I mean, that's really, you know, I mean, look at Hatha, the, the root Hatha, forceful. It's just, you know, as James Manson says, something, something that you do bloody mindedly, as we say in English, like, like you know, stubborn, like yeah. stu anything that you get up every day and you don't want to do it. And I mean, you know, I've never wanted to go, get up and do yoga first thing in the morning. I wanted to have a coffee and I used to want to have a coffee and a cigarette and, and a croissant or something, you know, like now the coffee and the croissant are still there, the cigarette is not, um, but you know, that you do something consistently against your natural desires for comfort and ease, yeah? Mm -hmm. and, and out of that, that methodology, which has always been at the root of yoga, right? Something done consistently, you know? And we can't say that much else specifically around it, 
as a practice of embodiment, but anything done consistently, and I think over a period of time, the mind will, you know, will, will naturally settle down into asking further questions about it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and have you ever gotten any sort of pushback? So being a Westerner teaching, yeah. learning in India, and then teaching in India to Indians, has there ever been, have you ever felt uncomfortable with something? Yeah, I feel or highly have you, embarrassed. Have, have every, time, every, time, yeah. Yeah? every time there's an Indian person sitting in front of me, I, I, you know, and I'm doing a yoga philosophy thing, and you know, let's be clear, I'm an asana teacher, you know, and, and I have an interest in the philosophy background. I'm no yoga scholar, um, but I do like to talk about it with people because I think it's relevant, and I think it, it ultimately, your own physical practice will run dry yeah. if it's not got a dynamo behind it. I mean, I would have never gotten up as we used to be encouraged at 1.30 in the morning or wherever to do this asana practice if it was just about having nice abs, you know what I mean? Which was yeah. an interest at the, at the start, when I was 20, you know? But that has to grow and it has to fructify into something deeper. Otherwise, the, 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 it's going to dry up, you know? Right. And so, so I always bring this, this context of a greater context around it. But yes, of course, I mean, there's many interest, you know, interested Indians these days and, you know, generally they're often you know, attracted to the asana because it's something that they recognize one yeah. and something that, that, that often their bodies are more apt for, more predisposed for than a, you know, a Caucasian white body. Mm -hmm. You know, the, 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 the modality often makes a lot more sense yeah. when I see an Indian body practicing it than a stiff old white guy in the city of London, <laughs> which is yeah. why I, where I was teaching, right? It makes sense, you know, they can do the stuff, right? Um, but yeah, when we start talking about yoga philosophy, yes, I'm super embarrassed. Because I assume that, you know, like I'm, you know, I'm talking about something which is their tradition, their culture. Yeah. And I'm assuming that their knowledge is way broader than mine on it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, yeah. Well, what to do? Yeah. <laughs> but I think it's, it's nice to hear that you're always looking to bring that deeper context for people. Because, you know, like you said, for some people, they just reduce it, yeah, to yoga for abs or yoga for a nice booty or something like that. And it's, and like, I, th I know that a lot of Indians, when they go online and see representations mm. of yoga like that, they feel quite uncomfortable. Yeah, well, it's offensive. You know, it's highly offensive. I mean, yeah, it's using a term which is so deep, and, you know. Yeah, and it's also yeah. a bit alienating. Like, yeah. this is not what I grew mm. up learning as yoga. So a lot of Indians also, um, for them, yoga is not about asana mm. so much. Like, they practice yoga as chapa or chanting or, you know, service or kriya. And then to go and see, you know, just this physical form of yoga can be a bit alienating. Yeah, yeah so, I mean, like, how do you respond to that when you see yoga like that? Does it bother you? I think it bothers me. Yeah, I mean, and more recently, and I kind of understand as I travel the world more and yeah. I see other appropriations of my own culture, I understand the feeling a bit more. Yeah. You know, um, on the other hand, I wouldn't legislate that you know people can't interpret things mm -hmm. also as they want. It, it yeah. seems a bit kind of a bit harsh and a bit kind of negative. Like, I mean, you know, for example. You know, I was just in a cafe here in Goa and I'm seeing Indian people playing brilliantly, by the way, fantastic covers of, of songs that I grew up listening to that, that have a culture around them and they have a place and certain bands. They are talking about certain experiences which are particular to Britain, you know, in particular to what we kind of went through and, you know, and, and are, are growing up, you know. Um, can other people enjoy them and talk about them? Of course, I wouldn't want to deny that. I mean, the same when we were in Thailand at Christmas. The Thais are getting super interested in Christmas. Of course, it's only Santa, literally Santa, and eating, like not the traditional stuff that we eat even, you know, and, and, and buying stuff. But, you know, it seems a bit unfair to say, well, they can't practice, you know, we can't enjoy anything about Christmas, you know what I mean? Um, of course, so yeah. in some capacity, I don't want to go too far down the line. They, you, you have to get it in order to do it. Yeah. You know, and I kind of think if anyone's interested, over time, I think they'll, they'll look further, you know, and if they're not, then, you know, well, whatever, you know. Um, to that, yeah, to that end, I think that, well, there is something else which is a method, and I think that that, that can pertain to something outside of culture. It's not yeah. cultural even, you know. Mm -hmm. So you have this experience, which is cultural. I don't think the Western will ever understand the deep culture that all this comes out of. Right. It's like, I'm not sure that any person who wasn't brought up in Manchester, for example, will ever fully understand some of the, the, the Manchester movement of music that came out of that time. You know, even me from London, you know, like you'll never know what it was like, you know, in, in, a, in a felt sense, right? right? Nevertheless, can someone enjoy it, of course, and, you know, on a deeper level, because this metaphor doesn't exactly work, there's also in the yoga context, 
a methodology which is independent of, co of culture, which yeah. you can extract from it. You know? yeah. Albeit that that methodology has changed, right? Mm -hmm. And it's become, at one point it was penance, basically tapas, you know, mm -hmm. resisting reality, really, restraint. You right. know? And at another point it was kind of reversed, you know, around the medieval period and became a tantric thing of, yeah. you know, this chakras and kundalini and nadis and all this stuff that people like to talk about now, yeah. you know, which is it's a different methodology as well, you know? Yeah. And then more recently we have Krishnamacharya who, He's really the first person using yoga for therapy. You know, I mean, he he mit, he admits, you know, there's two reasons you can use this. And one, he was a super, you know, a, a, a classical and an orthodox Brahmin guy, and he was using it for the, the context of knowing God. But then he was also using and teaching it for yoga as a therapy. You know, and he was admittedly said that, and he used methodology accordingly to to do that. You know, so so there's different iterations at different times. You know, as well. Um, I don't know whether that answers your question, but it yes, does, it's, a, you know, yeah. it's kind of offensive seeing the yoga for abs and, and you know and stuff. But then you kind of wonder well, what are they saying at all, really? Is it this is just this is so far off beam that it kind of you know it, it becomes utterly, irrelevant, utterly yeah. ridiculous, really. You know. <laughs> Nevertheless, I want, just want to say before you you ask something else is that the thing with the yoga is that you know in the modern sense is you've got a breath related movement, mm -hmm. and I think that if we're kind of looking practically speaking, more specifically, that will win through. And it affected me in a different way than my martial arts background right. or anything else that I was doing, which was concentrated movement. It wasn't just yeah. kicking a football around. It, you know, yeah. I was already in concentrated movement practices, but something about the breath related movement that felt different. Right. And if that's not there and they're talking about yoga for abs and stuff, I would say that's such a travesty and so ridiculous that you just, just swipe, <laughs> you know, that's, you know, but if they are talking about breath related movement and they're talking about abs sooner or later, I think that that you know, the, the, something people win through because, you know, we, we exist on so many levels and I would say all of us still have mixed motives towards yoga. Like if we didn't, then we wouldn't be doing it. We wouldn't need it. You know, if we knew ourselves and we're interested in ourselves and related to God, then we really wouldn't need to get on a mat. But we've kind of got these ideas about ourselves and about our ego and about yeah. our bodies and about other people pissing us off. And, you know, we've got all these other ideas to kind of, to kind of um, diminish to get to a more clearer motive. So I'd say we all come with mixed motives anyway. And if the motive is to get nice abs and also to breathe and, and something about the breathing, and you know, and then I think that ultimately over time, as I said originally, that mo deeper motive is going to be wheedled out, is going to, yeah. And I think it's perfectly okay to come to yoga with a physical motive initially. But I think if yeah. the teacher stays true to, like you said, the breath related movement, the kind of mindset that you're trying to cultivate, the philosophy that drives it, then at some point that deeper inclination will ignite but like so then my question to you is like if you have a student who's come to you for the ashtanga practice they're learning the primary series but they're kind of hungry for something more mm. um, and they want to do it like authentically because i've i've spoken to a lot of students here at purple valley and they ask me you know we this is how we understand yoga but how do you feel about it what do indians think about it you know and they're a bit uncomfortable that they don't want to offend or do something that's you know wrong and i feel that's also it shouldn't be that people are too scared also i think that's also against the spirit of yeah. yoga that you know shouldn't scared take it to too seriously wrong. yeah but yeah. at the same time yeah like how do you how would you introduce them to right um yeah if they're looking for something yeah, deeper. yeah 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 this i think you know like we have to remember that when yoga came to the West, it came under the auspices of asana first, right? Like, so, mm. you know, everyone loves a good yoga sutras, right? You know, in asana, there's obviously the eight limbs, right? And, you know, it's a good little checklist, you know? Um, and asana was prioritized by BKS Iyengar and, you know, Krishnamacharya in his early days and, uh, and, and Joyce um, and Bikram and, you know, and anyone. And they're all, you know, I mean, Bikram even was, you know, they were all interested in something more and they were using asana because it attracted people, you know, and, and and this idea that, you know, Joyce used to say, and I'm, um, and Yengo used to say, you know, how can you know God if you don't know your big toe? You know, there's something about purifying that, you know, the, the cleansing the doors of perception, as Huxley would say, first of all, before you can think clearly. You give someone a yoga text, they're just going to, you know, and they're, you know, I think English bloke like me, and they're just going to read it with that complete conditioning there until something has happened to the body energy. I mean, there's this understanding in yoga that, the body and the mind uh, uh, cannot be separated, you know, which, uh, which I think is another particularity that defines yoga from non-yoga, which is, you know, this is a kind of a, an important kind of thing. You yeah. know, it's like 
to, to try and extrapolate what is it that we're doing and, and what can we call that and what can we just dismiss as, as utterly ridiculous and nothing to do with yoga. To answer your question, the way that you stretch can start to confer the meaning, right? So yoga, we, let's call it, it's still a restraint, right? The Tanjali sense restraint, restraining the senses, they're the bridge to the inner body and the desire. And you restrain the desire and the senses and the motive even, looking at the Gita, you restrain the motive or, the fr or looking for the fruits of the action, and then you're thrust back on yourself. You, what are you left with? If you don't have a motive anymore, which is the idea of the Gita really, or you know, if, you don't, if you're not interested in desire anymore, you know, if you're trying to cut, the, then what is this? You know, like what is the meaning of it? Right? And I think that can be symbolized in the way people stretch. So if we're encouraging people, you know, pushing people, pushing people into further demonstrative, bigger shapes, pushing people further into a shape without an idea of balancing the yoga, that the yoga is a, that the asana is contextualized by te right tension, forces that balance each other, pointing back into the body. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if people aren't given this understanding in the asana, in the very symbolized nature of the asana, then of course they're just going to think about yoga is the normal stuff, like it's about desire for betterment, you know, about personal accomplishment, embellishment, and something in the future that's going to be better for me, you know. Yeah. But if you take that away and you say, well, actually yoga, first of all, you know, you're mainly genetics anyway, and your body will only do what your body does generally. And so try and find a sense of balance in it, you know, and that balance is already, it's not, it's nothing to do with accomplishment necessarily, although that can be a motivation for a while, but it's really trying to balance the pushing out of yourself to the pulling back into yourself. And if that's understood, on, a, on the physical level, then it, it, you know, it, it's right there. It, it trickles straight down to, to using the physicality to reflect back the deeper intents. But if you're just pushing, and unfortunately the Ashtanga method is this kind of linear, kind of like chase the carrot thing. And it, it kind of lends itself to that in a way, keeps the motor running, right? But also encourages the ego. You know? mm -hmm. Nevertheless, I think if you stick with it long enough, sooner or later that whole parade is going to crumble you know you're going to get injured you're going to get disappointed you're going to get to an advanced sequence and just think you know what now you know like and, and you know you'll be thrown back I, I kind of believe that human nature is essentially intelligent and 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 has the deepest question at heart you just got to cut through all the bullshit to get to that deep, deepest question that's already there in our heart which is what is self and what the hell am i doing here mm -hmm. you know um so yes i mean i think it's construed in the way that you actually teach the literal asana don't even need to touch yoga philosophy. Right. Um, you know, you don't even need And then to. maybe just have trust that the, the, the practice and the technique itself will give birth to that, yeah. you know, that deeper yeah. you know, curiosity or yeah, guess, seeking you know, yeah. or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And you also realize, you know, like one's own limitations, right? Like, you know, I'm just a yoga teacher and I've enjoyed the method for a bunch of years, you know, and I'm interested in, you know, philosophy. I mean, albeit Indian philosophy and Western philosophy. I'm interested in just self-inquiry, you know, and, and you know, and the roots are very similar. Okay, one over here, you know, is talking about water lilies and one over here is talking about lotus flowers. So they're different things, you know, and I think the danger is to kind of say, well, they're all talking about exactly, the, well, yes and no, you know, this is a method and it has cultural nuances and perspective around it. And over here, this is a method which looks very similar, but it's also that method, you know, which has its own kind of informed kind of relationship as well, you know, so it's easy to kind of, oh, the, it's all the same. It's kind of not, but you know, Going back to your question, I think that you have to realize your limitations as an asthma teacher, what you are, and then you've got other tools. Like, I mean, I've interviewed on my podcast and the stuff that I do, a whole bunch of much more intelligent people than me who, Indian and non-Indian and academic Indians and non-academic, you know, who, who do know a lot more. And then I can infer students now, you know, listen to that podcast or, you know, read that book that I really loved. I mean, there's a bunch of, you know, there's a bunch of tools at our hands. And I think it, it, as a yoga teacher, you're not expected to know everything. And I think that's really important to say, you know, because I think it, one feels already that a sense of imposter syndrome. Who am I, you know, in the end to, to legislate on someone else's peace of mind, you know, even on someone else's body and, and embodied feeling of the body. Who am I to do that? Okay. So already this kind of imposter syndrome is there. And so therefore the teacher, you know, kind of, feels like uh, to kind of rebuff it by kind of feeling like, oh, you know, I know and, and I, you know, and you don't, you know, and I think it's important to say, well, I don't know any more than you do really necessarily, but I have a whole bunch of tools that you might not know about and I can point you in directions. Right. And, and that for some people, they resolve that discomfort of not knowing enough by going to the method and sticking to the method and being like, this is the way that I learned it and this is the authentic traditional and then also appealing to the idea of lineage um, 
And I think that, that, that there's value to that, um, to kind of understand where it comes from, where the ideas originate and how they've evolved. But at the same time, yeah, when that discomfort gets too much, it can almost become a bit authoritarian that you feel, you know, that there has to be a mediated way to access yoga and a particular method. And it can be easy to just get caught up in those details to a point where it almost becomes ideological. Yeah. Um, so, so how, I mean, yeah, how do you respond to that temptation while also staying true to the teachings that you've learned? I think we come at a kind of a really interesting point in history, really. And, you know, since, say, Vivekananda and this idea, he's, you know, he famously said, go into your room and get you Upanishads out of yourself. <laughs> you know, which is, you know, similar to the kind of reformations going on around Christianity in a way and other places say, like, you don't have to have a mediated experience of God or yourself anymore. You know, you can do it yourself, you know, and you can use certain methodology to take the bull by the horns and, and, and have this experience, which, which is always going to be a subjective experience in, this, in the end, you know. Um, and same in, in, the, in the Bhagavad Gita, right? You know, there's this idea that, you know, in the end, the Vedas is, for someone who knows the truth, it said, the Vedas is irrelevant, you know, because the truth is embodied. You know, the truth is I am, or, you know, in, in kind of terms of Jesus, or, 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 or I am that, you know, in, in, you know, if we look in this tradition, you know, it, it don't need more information, really. We're up to the hilt with information already, really. So, you know, um, but we're in an interesting time, I think, where we have been allowed more autonomy than maybe we ever had in terms of what we are able to do. And I think that's really important. But then I think it swings to the other, the, the kind of whole new age thing was like the problem with that and the syncretism that we find around that and, 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 and this kind of picking a little bit from here and there is you end up with no method anymore, you know? Mm. So, I mean, tradition is something which I'm so, I mean, I'll never kind of tire of discussing because it's, it, it's such a nuanced topic and there's no conclusive answer. It's like, well, tradition, I mean, is, it's always something which has been generally wielded by, at, uh, you know, as a vessel of control, but it also contains a, a methodology and a way of doing things that has also worked for many, many people. So to try and reinvent a method now, rather than use all the people that have gone before, you know, is kind of super hubristic and as well as yeah. really stupid, you know, but on the other hand, we have to have a sense of autonomy in the face of the method as well. Otherwise we're just, again, fitting ourselves to conforming to someone else's ideas about how we should turn up, how we should be, how we should move, you know. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's no easy answer out of that. True. But, you know. and, and being here and learning from so many teachers, I can see that each person finds their, a different point to balance this, like this whole question. And yeah, I've come to realize that there are a lot of ways to do it and do it well. Um, and yeah, it doesn't have to look the same for each teacher. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so for me, that, that really opened my mind up a lot yeah. to see that there are so many ways of being authentic to the tradition while also being true to like the lived experience of your students and of yourself and what you see. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think we have to kind of look at the deeper aspect that's non not about specifics or politics or, you know, or belonging to a club and say, well, you know, what was the essence of Krishnamacharya's teaching, right? Because this is kind of like, you know, you know, he, him and a couple of other guys are pretty kind of, you know, there at the center of what we're currently doing. So what was he doing, right? You know, it was based on vinyasa, the idea of entering and exiting a posture with awareness, um, counter posture, and, you know, it's dynamic. It was a modern way to move, whereas previously to that, uh, you know, back in, in, in India and also uh, in the West, static forms of movement were more the norm until more modern, iterations of how a body moves, right? Free of clothes and free of, uh, you know, of, of working all day, you know, having a super hard life. So dynamic movement is also at the heart of that, you know? And then you've got the, this methodology of what Patabi Joyce calls the Tristana, the, the Bandha, ideas of Bandha, posture, and Drishti, you know? And those are also found at the heart of the classical tantric texts as Mahaveda, Mahamudra, Mahabandha, you know? although without the dynamism aspect. So as long as you've got that at the heart of it, I think that that's the method. And the specifics of where you should put your foot or whether you need to follow the exact part of the sequence, it's, you know, uh, I think that they're not mutually contradictory, you know? Um, exactly, yeah. And I think that even in this experience of teaching this time, I have a new appreciation for the importance of the joy sequences because they just, you know, everyone doing the same thing in the room is kind of helpful. And the start and the stop of 
vinyasa and breath is kind of helpful. Although, albeit that you're trying in the end to, to not need those, those things anymore, to have a you know, more spontaneous and individual-centered practice, mm -hmm. I think in the early days it's, it's still quite useful. But we also have to acknowledge that the sequences aren't a, they're not a magic combination locked to enlightenment, you know, like, and, and, and you can use placeholders and you can adapt the posture to suit you and you can find the essence of the posture, which is not the outer form, but the essence of opposing forces in the posture, you know? So there's something in there to be preserved, but I don't think it needs to be as literal as if you can't bind in Mary Charles and you can't do any more. I mean, that's not my take, but yeah. I would still call myself inverted commas, a, 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 a modern traditional Ashtanga, because mm -hmm. you know, the Ashtanga tradition is still very recent, really, you know, like, mm -hmm. you know, it's not thousands of years old. I don't believe and go back to the yoga Karunta, you know, but I mean, the, the, the basis of, of this asana practice as being formatted on Bandha and posture and drishti and you know the idea of vinyasa within that and the use of certain sequences to you to get further into that which is very helpful as well is you know i think it's you know still a teaching tool that i enjoy it and i just want to add that the mythology around that whole thing i don't necessarily want to disband either although it is fairly disbanded now but you know i mean i got into it because you know, this whole thing about Joyce originally and about his guru and about Rama Mohan Brahmachari and the yoga career. You know, it's kind of sad that Father Christmas has been killed, you know, like in a way, you know, because mm. I think working myths, we all trade on life on working myths, you know, mm -hmm. and to just have a thing rational is not OK. It might be truer in a literal sense, but it doesn't really motivate you, you know, and we're not rational at the heart. We're emotional at the heart. And, and I think, you know, working, you know, into some mythology and, and having these things is still... I don't know how we equate that to the modern Ashtanga, you know, but okay. it's somewhat relevant. So, so you think that's an aspect that's missing? Well, it is the now, I mean, more recently yeah. with the whole Joyce thing and, and okay. you know, and then, you know, people that I like and modern scholars that I like, they'll talk about where Krishnamacharya actually got the sequences from and, mm. you know, like Mark Singleton's book that many people have heard, The Yoga Body and other people that were before him and after him that talk similarly and, you know, it comes out that, okay, you know, I was mad when I read The Yoga Body, first of all, I must admit, you know, like, you know, how, how could it be that, you know, this yoga that I've been practicing is, is, you know, may have been partly, you know, ripped off from even Western calisthenics, you know, not only the Indian stuff, but, you know, the stuff that's coming from the West, you know, and I wanted it to be, you know, Indian, but that's also True, yeah. a kind of appropriation <laughs> away in the esoteric Indianness of it, or I'm doing something special because it's other, you mm -hmm. know. So in, in some respects, I'll argue against my cause and say, well, you know, in having it, you know, there in your face what it is, it then makes you question a bit more. What is this then? If it's not all that mystical stuff that I kind of don't understand, but I kind of give it precedence because it is kind of non-understand, you know, kind of other, you know. Right. But on the other hand, I think that we're in danger of kind of squashing the, that kind of extra thing out of it by just treating it like a, you know, a modern Western calisthenics, which is mm. not, you know. Um, yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's a really delicate, Delicate balance. But you said something interesting, which was that you would define your approach currently as a modern traditionalist approach. Yeah. But the word modern right. was what? used. And and you've had an interesting like journey through, you know, kind of going into Mysore and working with that particular style of approaching Ashtanga mm. to now kind of having developed a more individual approach to it, which is still very rooted in that tradition, but but also making more space for different, you know, needs of people and, and the different kind of minds and bodies yeah. that come yeah. to the practice. So maybe you can talk a bit about like what your journey through this was and where you, where you are at now. I think that the lack of individual adaptation and the rigidity mm. is greatly done by Western students coming back and they're holding the method and saying well I know the method and you don't and therefore it's a way of justifying their position as teachers if you actually go to Mysore it's always been more individually used for, for people you know for older people they've always been given carte blanche to go through and do you know and carry on and you know and for other people who a lacking ability, They've, you know, it's never been as litigious as Western teachers coming back and saying, well, this is how you do it. And, you know, and again, it becomes this, you know, I'm the teacher because I know the sequence and I'll stop you and control you. And therefore a kind of justification of my teaching in a censorious manner, you know, in, in no, you know, which is, I really hate that, you know. Um, on the other hand, I also think that, yes, the method in Mysore was tightened up and increasingly tightened up. Joyce didn't start teaching 
in such a rigid manner, although he had his yoga curriculum pinned to the wall when David Williams went, you know, he was able to modify it and he taught Nancy Gilgoff completely differently to the way he taught David Williams, you know, I mean, so and knowing these things, you know, and that's why I started the podcast in the first place, knowing these things, it makes you approach things differently, you know, and I had the feeling that the whole thing was way too rigid and authoritarian and the Westerners were using it to kind of control them and, and, and assert their position and I didn't like it. There's something intuitively I didn't like about it. My experience in my soul was that there was a method, but if it was logist, if, if it was, if it was censorious in any manner or, or codified in a manner, I felt it was simply due to logistics in the end. You know? I mean, Joyce changed his teaching and Sharat changed his teaching. The more people that came through and the more wild cards you have, you know, you have a whole bunch of people. Many of them are, don't hardly know much about Ashtanga now and you know, they'll make the journey, you know. And what are you going to do? Like, you know, like you can't do that stop, you know, you can't have a, you can't sit down with them and say, well, you know, what's your practice like? You know, like what's your health history like? You know, like, you know, you just have to have easy answers, right? You can't, you know, like you can't stand up for a back bend. Okay. You know, like, you know, the, the, you have to stop, you know, practice there. It's like, you know, the, these things were put in, you know, due to numbers, you know, and more cynically, I mean, due to getting people out faster in a way. I mean, Joyce, you know, I don't want to say this, but you know, Joyce certainly made changes over the years due to numbers and, and the fact that no one could stay so long. So, you know, we see this in the advanced series that originally there was this really long advanced series, right? but it was split up into four different series because he couldn't teach every, you know, people are having like four hour practices. I mean, Dina Kingsburg famously said to me, you know, she, she's practicing literally for four hours in there. And, and, you know, as more people came in, it's like, what are you going to do? It's like, you know, you can't have people doing that much. And mm. well, you could say, well, we'll therefore limit the numbers, but you know, and or why, why and wherefore that didn't happen. But I mean, if we look at it in the most positive light, more people get experience of, of, of that. And going back to something else, maybe even though I was practicing Ashtanga before I went to Mysore, I never understood it until I went to Mysore and I heard Batabi Joyce counting the method and, and Shrat teaching specifically in the Mysore. I never understood it in the same way outside Mm. That uh, that teacher, and even when I'd seen them on tour, it wasn't the same as going there. Um, so there's my rationale out the window because you know there's something that I experienced there in a deep way that I can't even really articulate. That still, I would say, needs to be spoken out loud. You know, um, there, was, there was something else that I experienced there. You know, um, yeah. But I don't see any discrepancy. I feel I'm a traditional Ashtanga teacher. But I still teach the method. I think there's something helpful about sticking to something and, and devoting to something higher than yourself and rather than other, you know, I just fancy this vinyasa today and I fancy doing this today and it's a bit of a slippery slope, you know. Like before I went to Mysore, you know, I started adding in all the handstands and all the stuff I wanted to do, you know, taking out stuff and fudging stuff that I couldn't really do. So you go to Mysore and, and you, know, you have the sequence and there's some element of something else that happens because you can't kind of get around it anymore, you know, like you have to give yourself over to, to a method right. and a perspective which isn't right. always of your liking. So, yeah, yeah, I think there's value to yeah. that, to surrendering to something that, that just exists and seeing what might come up for you without like, yeah. also giving up your preconceptions a yeah. little bit. Yeah. I mean, I think the danger in that is then the teacher then takes that and says, well, you know, like as, as a kind of, well, I'm going to push your buttons by denying you postures and by saying you can't do this and this and so, it, you know, it can swing both ways. Yeah. You know, and that's when you have to really have the compassion and the understanding of why you're really teaching, you know, and see what the individual body can and can't do. And sometimes I would still, I still keep a person at a posture if I know that they, with a little bit more concentration, will do it, you know. You know, just keep kind of, kind of, I'll go and do more and more and more. But on the other hand, if, if their genetics and their current ability is, and their frustration is there building, you know, months and months ago by, it's like, yeah. yeah. A lot of it's fairly pragmatic, really. You know, you don't want someone to one push themselves further and injure themselves trying to do something because they're frustrated, or two, quit because you know that they're so bored and frustrated about you stopping. So, you know, with tools and, and used by a sensible adult, I think that there's no discrepancy between continuing a method which which worked for me and which works for many, and and altering it so it's compassionate and holistic and helpful to the individual as well. You know. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting way to look at it. Yeah. So where do you stand on this idea of that yoga has become um, and that it's kind of just like a therapy 
like a form of therapy mm. or something that you do to feel good or yeah. um, just like reduce some anxiety mm. at the end mm. of the day, which is all valuable forms valid, of using yeah, yoga. Yeah, valid. But then, um, yeah, you know, how do you yeah, respond to that? Because there is obviously yoga means something different when you look at the text and, and where it comes from. Yeah. I think there was a quote by George Fernstein, uh, Fernstein in, in Yoga Unveiled, a movie years ago, and he says, well, you know, it's as if like, that's all well and good. I mean, you know, like feeling better and reducing anxiety and yoga for mental health and, you know, yoga for trauma awareness. They're all really, you know, relevant, valid and, and, and should be reasonable ways to, to use and, and apply yoga. But on the other hand, George Fernstein says like, it's just kind of like a little bit to short change oneself to end there. And I think one big difference between yoga as a therapy now and yoga in Krishnamacharya's idea of therapy is that the Eastern perspective isn't treats the body holistically as a whole that functions together, body, mind, and spirit, you know, um, and emotions, whatever we call emotions in, in that. And, and the Western perspective still has this dualistic approach. As much as we try and get rid of it, we kind of can't, you know, it's, it's, in the, it's in the hard wiring now between body and mind. So when people approach yoga as a therapy now, they say, well, you know, I'm gonna, I need to add the pigeon to do, you know, to open the hip or, mm. you know, I need to do some different stretches to get into this back bend. And it's like, well, it's understandable. And, and in a way I go down that path and, you know, I say like, you know, Yes, for some people, some kind of preparations are useful and necessary, but I'm, I'm reticent to go too far down that path because mm. when Krishnamacharya was talking about yoga therapy, he was looking at the, a, a methodology of, of treating the whole body together and using kind of a tool to do so. So the idea of the rhythm and the bandha and the certain posture, it was looking at the tension and it was trying to approach the tension much more deeply than simply in the Western deconstructionist way, which is to say my hip is tight, therefore the cause is my hip, therefore the result, the, the, the conclusion will be to work on my hip. Whereas what Krishnamacharya is saying is much deeper than that. It's like, no, your hip isn't tight because of just your hip. Your hip is tight because of the matrix of general tension in one's whole body. Now, one has to be clear that it's not like, oh, you're stiff, therefore your mind's stiff. I really don't like that either. You know, mm. We've all got tension in the body and it goes much deeper. You know, how, how that manifests will be different for each person. But it's like, you know, treating the hip as just the, the cause and the effect, it doesn't make sense. I mean, the, there's structural tightness in the body, not just because the muscle's tight, because random. The muscles that, you know, we hold ourselves in certain emotional patterns of tension and they affect, you know. Yeah. And so when we're using the methodology, keeping to that flow, and there's something about getting in the flow state, getting in the groove, getting in that rhythm, it unlocks the spirit and the emotions in a deeper way than I think you ever could with the mind. Because basically you're using the mind kind of against the body. You know, there's a battle, a battle has been set up. I feel that my hip is tight and I, the mind needs to rectify that. And the body has, wants to be heard. It has a tightness that needs to be heard and acknowledged. You know, the body's operating on, a different, on different routes, on different paradigm, you know? And so you're, you're in this constant battle of, well, I'm not good enough, my body is tight. Pushing against that with the mind, you know, in the yoga class becomes a battle rather than saying, well, you know, we're addressing the whole spirit here, you know, and, it's, and, and there's something going on much deeper and the whole thing will gradually unfold from inside out mm. rather than looking at it top down from the mind to the body, mind controlling body, or li linearly or deconstructionist, oh, my hip is tight or my back, or my lower back, therefore I have to treat it with X, Y, Z. It, it's two slightly different right. approaches. Right. And albeit that I think there is something to say about doing you know, for some people to do extra things in the, to help with certain conditions. I think that the ultimate yoga therapy, it, you know, it treats the root cause, you know, in a deeper way than what we might do now, which is to look at the, the, the head of a weed and just pluck the head off. We haven't addressed the root, you know, it's mm. still there. You know? yeah. It goes deeper than that. You know? yeah. And I think the physical practice can kind of silence some of these overly rational or the need to have like a cause and an effect and then something that makes total sense. Because yeah, from my experience, I do like some days, I just can't explain why it's, I'm so open. Yeah. You know, maybe I didn't yeah. practice for two weeks, yeah. but I still just, something about my mind that's able to surrender or, you know, I'm just in a good mood or something. And everything feels different in my body. So I think even just doing the physical practice can help you see those connections that don't make total sense, yeah. initially at least, yeah. And maybe never to the mind. I mean, I think when you talk about colonialization or appropriation of yoga, I really, I mean, my, my particular positioning of that term would be around the rationalization of, of a system 
which doesn't, which doesn't operate on those lines. It's not a Western rationalistic system. It's not deconstructionist. It's treating the parts as a whole rather than the whole and trying to deconstruct them and treat them as parts. So that's where I see the particular danger of yoga these days, uh, outside the silliness of yoga for rock hard abs or a good booty or whatever, the insidiousness of Western rationalism, then making yoga into a different thing along the mental lines. You know, and that's where the real danger lies. And that's where I would like to say, well, this is a methodology which doesn't operate along the same kind of uh, way of looking at the world. It doesn't have the same worldview. You know? But Western rationalism is so all encompassing now, it's encroaching everywhere. You know? But I think, I mean, it's wonderful to hear that you're thinking so deeply about these things. And yeah, this is a really wonderful yeah. conversation. Thanks. Yeah, thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. I hope we can talk more again sometime when you're back in I Goa. I so too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thank Thanks you. for having me.